Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Resettling the Settled. You know, for so long, the church has been spiritually asleep. We have let false teaching, lukewarm love, and complacent doctrine and teaching slip into our church and just lulled us to sleep. It's running rampant throughout the church. But these days are the very last days. We, the church, must wake up. We must wake up and smell the stink of prayerlessness and apathetic worship. We must wash our face with boldness and confidence. And we must jump into the fight. We need not take, take things for granted because we are in a spiritual fight. We are in the last days and we need one last revival in these last days. We need souls saved. The church must exit with a sonic bang, just like the church entered with a sonic boom as the Holy Spirit descended like the sound of a mighty Russian wind. Remember, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Men and women are not our enemy. They're not our adversary. Although it may appear to be, they are not our adversaries. They are not our opponents. We fight the spiritual battle on our knees because we fight the spiritual. The word of God is our weapon and the garment of praise is our covering. The shield of faith is our protection and our Lord Jesus Christ is our commander in chief. Please would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 through 14. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when everything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We are instructed not to take part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather we must expose them. For so long the church has walked so close to the dividing line, the dividing line between ecclesiastical and the, and the secular. For so long we've been teaching these lukewarm teaching and lukewarm theology that it has has, the church has unknowingly strayed so far over that many, many have been lost along the way. Many have fallen off because they no longer understand what we stand for. Christianity Today's headlines read, America's oldest denomination faces split over LGBT issues. The director of communications for the Reformed Church in America said, and I quote from Christianity Today's website, At General Synod, delegates come from across the RCA to discern the mind of Christ together. There are difficult decisions on the agenda, along with many things to celebrate, and we're praying that the Holy Spirit guides every decision. She says that the delegates come together to discern the mind of Christ and that they're praying that the Holy Spirit guides every decision. But what is there to discern? What is there to pray about? All you have to do is to turn off the programming, turn off the social media and begin to read your Bible and you will discern what the mind of Christ is. The problem here is the pressing question that is threatening their already dying denomination. That is that of sexuality, which was settled centuries ago, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Leviticus chapter... 18 verse 20 through 23 says, And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. We are not to commit adultery. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. We are not to abort our children. We are to give our 
or God, or God thanks for our children. Verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Homosexuality is a sin against our God. Verse 23, and you shall not lie with any animal and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. We are not to commit bestiality. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 says, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. And there are those who say, Brother Kenny, you are outdated. That is the Old Testament. We no longer follow that anymore. That is irrelevant. Our society has evolved way past that since then. But here's what Paul said about the law in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 11. He says, Now we know that the law is good if, if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The law was laid down for the lawbreakers, not for those who are holy to their God, but those who break the law, those who decimate the natural laws, and those who break the law of God, the creator and judge of the whole world. God go, or Paul goes on to explain that God's stand on sexual perversion is this in Romans chapter 1 verse 27. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. The church has to wake up and stop being influenced by the world and begin to be motivated by the truth. The word of God is truth. We do not have a whole lot of time left to, to get our loved ones in and to get our neighbors in, our friends in, our co-workers, the family in. So with this little bit of time that we do have left, we should use it wisely and we should proclaim the full gospel and get those people who are not ready to be ready for Jesus is coming back real, real soon. And if we are to win souls, we must win them with the truth. And we must start now. James chapter 4 verse 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So you judge for yourself. Consider which is more profitable, to be a friend of the world or to be a friend of God. That old beloved him says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. If we are so busy making the world our friend, we lose the time we should spend in friendship with our true friend, Jesus Christ, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. 
But Christians let political correctness pervert them from making a stand. They prevent them from saying that is wrong. Such and such is against the will of God. They choose to be quiet about the things of in, that ensure life. And they choose to be quiet about the things that cause death, eternal death. The world is not concerned about your soul. The world is not concerned about where you will spend eternity. The world is not concerned with whether or not you're prepared to meet your maker. Today is the day of repentance. They march, the world, they march to a different beat. They march to a different drum. So no matter how hard you try, you will never be in step with the world as long as you are a Christian. It is, it is completely an, a different rhythm altogether. It says as different as a 3-4 beat is from a 4-4 beat. The two will never ever be in harmony. Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans how to discern the will of God. He says in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to pre present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. In short, we must listen to and evaluate what is being said and what is being taught and what is being propagated. Then we are to test it. In other words, we are to compare it to what the word of God says. If, if it for some reason it does not line up, if for some reason it does not match up, if for some reason it's different from what the word of God says, if it is not in full and complete congruency, then we are to throw it out. We are to leave it alone. We are to, to dismiss it completely as false and misleading. We are to drop it like a hot potato. When it is not a blatant, or when it is a blatant contradiction to the word of God, and a little more in-depth analysis is needed, then we need to go into some prayer to find out what the will of God is. If it is not that clear for us to understand, then we take that to prayer. But if God's word says, do not do it, then there is no need to pray about it. That is what Balaam did in Numbers chapter 22 all the way through to 24. Although he knew God's good and perfect will, he was enticed by the lure of wealth, the lure of profit. Enough, so, so much so that in Numbers chapter 22, verse 18 through 19, it says, But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God and to do less or do more. So you too, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And this is what Peter wrote about um, ba Balaam several um, hundred years later. Forsaken the right way, they, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain for wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. If we know for sure that the word of God says that a certain lifestyle is, is incorrect or a certain habit is wrong, then we are to forsake that lifestyle. We are to correct the course. We are not to continue in it. We are not to, to encourage it. It. We're not to overlook it, but we are to call it out. We are to correct the course that they may hear, that they may believe, that they may live and not die. 
We are all, all we need to do is to pray about the things that are not clear cut. The, the things that are ambiguous. In days of, uh, of antiquity, the lots was cast to, dis, to discern or to determine the will of God. Even the 11 apostles cast lots to, to determine um, who would take Judas's place in Acts chapter 1. But 10 days later in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came like a mighty Russian wind and it filled the whole place and it's divided up in tongues and sat upon each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and we never heard about casting lots to determine the will of God after that. For here is what the writer of the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God gave, spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, though through whom also he created the world. These last days, Jesus speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. But we cannot hear that still small voice if we are spiritually asleep. Just like Snow White in our, last, uh, in our last message last week could not wake herself up from slumber. Neither can we. It took true love's kiss to awaken her. And so too it is with us. It took true love's kiss for us to wake up from our spiritual sleep. And God's true love kiss is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It took the redeeming love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Dying on the tree to awaken our souls to the love of the Father. And to the love of his son. And to the love of his Holy Spirit. Which is the sealing of of our, our, our own seal, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and the beloved in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. God does not want any of us to go to the place of eternal flames, the place called hell. Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. As the Hillsong lyrics says, you did not want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great. Your love was greater. What could separate us now. There is nothing in all creation that can separate us from Jesus and from his love. And if nothing can separate us, then nothing can prevent us from knowing his good and perfect will for our lives. All we have to do is to have an active and consistent prayer life, a relationship, a real relationship with him, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Do you have that type of relationship with Jesus? Do you have a relationship with him? He died for you. He died for me. He died for us all. He died that you might live, that you might have life. Do you know him? Do you know eternal life? If you don't, has made it really simple. All you got to do is to say this prayer and mean it from your heart. Pray this prayer with me if you would like to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Teach me your ways. Teach me your precepts. Help me to know what your good and perfect will is for my life. I love you because you first loved me. Thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I would suggest you do is to 
Get yourself a Bible. Read your Bible every day. Highlight the promises. And, and commit those promises to memory. Believe. For whoever believeth shall not be put to shame. For faith. You cannot please God without faith. Have the faith for when Jesus comes back, he's looking for those that has faith. He said, will a son of mine find faith upon the earth? Find yourself a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches who embraces the things of the world, who does not stand up for holiness and for righteousness. Find yourself a true Bible-believing church and be a part of that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is he called you to do. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold to Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.